Have you ever sat down to write an email to your farm list and you're not sure what the heck you even want them to do? Like all you can think of is, hey, buy my product. Wouldn't it be nice to know of some other things you could ask them to do besides buy your stuff so that you don't always feel so salesy? Well, that's what today's episode is all about. We're going to talk about some of the calls to action that you have available to you when you sit down to write those emails. This is going to be a good one. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench and welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 239 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench, one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farms out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers like you get more confident in your marketing and sales strategies so that you can build a sales machine and grow a profitable business. How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to the show. If you're a regular listener and I'm back in your earbuds, that is so awesome. Thank you. And if you're brand new, I hope that you get something out of today's episode. Go check out some of my back issues. I always tell people to see if they want to listen to my first 10 episodes because those were designed to be an on-ramp into the marketing lingo. So if you're kind of green when it comes to marketing stuff, that's the place to go and get caught up. But you should also definitely get onto my email list because when you do, I'm gonna subscribe you to basically three months of a weekly email that's gonna drip out kind of my curated best selection of marketing tips for you as a farmer. It's, I hold your hand and I walk you through the process. It's really good, I get high marks for that email sequence that I send out. So you can get that by going to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. Easy to remember. Today's podcast is sponsored by my friends at Local Line. It's official. Local Line has launched their new and highly anticipated subscriptions feature. Now creating subscriptions for your customers has never been easier. Subscriptions allow your farm to turn one-time orders into recurring revenue. Use Local Line's subscription feature to run your CSA or increase your cash flow and increase customer loyalty. Subscriptions is very flexible. You can add, edit, and cancel subscriptions at any time in your back office and allow customers to manage their settings and add one-off purchases to their orders. You can also offer different subscriptions for different customers, like a standing order for chefs and a CSA box for CSA members. Local Line's subscriptions feature also supports variable weight products like meat and seafood, so you can offer subscription products to all your customers, no matter what you sell. In addition to all of that, Local Line subscriptions is very affordable. You can add it to your Local Line account for just $25 a month. Now, for podcast listeners of the My Digital Farmer podcast, Local Line is offering a free premium feature for an entire year when you sign up using my coupon code, MDF2023. That includes subscriptions. So why not try it out today? I love Local Line. Head to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash local line and be sure to use my coupon code MDF2023 to get that free premium feature for one whole year. For more information, check out the link in the show notes. And now back to the show. Well, welcome back to all of my fellow American farmers in the United States. I want to wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving. Hopefully you had an awesome weekend away. We went to the Mummy Bay Conference Center, which is on Lake Erie. We do that every year. It's a family reunion 
a lot of our family comes together and we swim and we play racquetball and we play lots of games and watch the Buckeyes play. It's a good time. My kids always enjoy it. So I'm fresh off of that. And actually next weekend, I'm leaving for a special birthday getaway. This is a special trip that I planned for myself to celebrate a big birthday that I recently celebrated. And we are going to Minneapolis to see the St. Olaf Choir perform in, I forget the name of the theater, but I have always wanted to see them perform. My dad and my brother went to St. Olaf College. I'm a singer. I love to sing. I love choir music. And I love this choir. And it's a dream of mine to see them in concert in person. And so that's what we're going to go do. We're going to fly up to Minneapolis for a couple nights, see them perform, and then quick fly back. Just me and Kurt. So I'm excited about that. And before I get started on today's episode topic, I wanted to make a quick announcement to all of my farmers out there, vegetable growers who are thinking about starting a CSA and you've been wondering if you should, you're wondering how to go about doing so. This is the time of year in early December when I always do my five-day CSA startup challenge. That's going to be beginning on December 4th through the 8th. And basically for this five-day period, I walk you through some of the key steps that you need to think about when you're starting a CSA from scratch. And this is based on our 15 years of experience building a CSA from 12 customers to now we have 400 members. We only run ours for 18 weeks, as many of you know, and it's a traditional style CSA. But I love teaching other farmers about the process for how to go about it because it does feel a little overwhelming. It's not something I recommend that you do if you're a brand new vegetable grower. You should have some experience under your belt, but it still can be a journey that is fraught with lots of questions. And so this challenge is something I do every year to try and guide farmers through the the big five things you need to think about as you're getting started. It's kind of a framework to sign up for that. If you want to go through the challenge with me, you just go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash CSA startup. And on December 4th, you will get your first video training emailed right to your inbox with your homework assignment for what you need to do that day to complete the challenge of the day. And we do that for five days in a row. So hopefully that sounds fun to some of you. Again, you can sign up at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash CSA startup, all one word. All right, let's pivot to today's topic. We're talking about calls to action in email marketing. And the reason I'm talking about this is because, well, number one, I'm a huge fan of email marketing. It's the primary way that I generate revenue in our farm business. And so I'm really passionate and I think I'm pretty good at teaching email marketing to other farmers. And I had a entire project on weekly emails inside of Accelerator last month for one of my cohorts. And we spent four weeks learning about how to write really great weekly emails, how to structure them, format them, what to talk about, best practices. And then we practiced every week writing a different weekly email. And then we met up together and we critiqued one another's work. We just got better at it. We noticed some things that were making a difference and moving the needle. One of the things that comes up when you're writing emails is that you need to have something for them to do when the customer or the prospect reads the email. There should always be a call to action. Every email needs a call to action because we are always taking our people somewhere. That is the job of a conversion copywriter is you are guiding them to the next step. You're always taking them somewhere. So what do you want this person to do next, whether they are already a customer and they've bought from you or they haven't bought from you yet. They're just on your email list and they need to be warmed up. We're always taking our people somewhere. And so we want to identify some of the possible things we could ask them to do. What are some of these different CTAs or calls to action as they're known? 
in the email marketing world. I like to think of CTAs as kind of like playing chess. I don't know if any of you enjoy playing chess like I do, but when you sit down and you're facing your opponent and you're trying to get to checkmate, there are many different ways that you can get to checkmate. There are a lot of different types of moves, uh, putting the sequence of moves in a different order that will get you to your ultimate destination. And it's kind of like that with writing emails. Like there's so many different ways you can get your customer to your destination. And when you know what that short list is, it just opens up some doors for you. It helps you see some other ways to get there and you don't feel quite so limited. And that's what I thought I would explore with you today. What are some of the different calls to actions that you have at your disposal when you're writing emails? And when you have this list next to you, it's really empowering. Suddenly writing the email doesn't feel quite so daunting because you're like, oh, I don't just have to ask them to buy. (laughs) There are some other things I can encourage them to do. Now, why do we want people to take action in our emails? And specifically, why do we want them to click on something? So let's, let's just cover that first question. Why do we want people to take action after reading an email? Well, where, when a customer or a prospect takes the desired action, any kind of action, it moves them a little bit closer to you in the relationship. And it creates just a little bit more loyalty to the brand. I like to tell this story about when I used to be a youth minister many years ago in a church, and we would talk about, as a leadership team, how important it was to get brand new people who are checking out the church service for the very first time to get them involved as soon as possible, like within three visits. And one of the ways we discovered this is because after worship was done, we were in a pretty small building. This was actually a startup church. And we would ask the members after worship to stack the chairs because we had a lot of programming going on during the week and we shared the same sanctuary space. We needed those chairs broken down. And we noticed that people were beginning to have interactions and conversations with one another in the process of tearing down the chairs every week. And that was sort of an aha moment for us as a leadership team to say, it's important to create moments like that, to give a job to someone to do when they're here for the first time. Because now that as they're stacking these chairs, they, they start a conversation with someone next to them who's maybe been there for a few months And they get to know each other, they introduce each other, and they know each other's names. And then the next week when they come back, they remember that person and they have someone they can go and talk to. And so this is a example of how we create these micro commitments when a person first enters our ecosystem. We're trying to find places for them to do something. We want to give them a call to action, even if it's very small Every time they take an action, it moves them a little bit closer, a little bit closer to becoming a committed member or in your case, a committed buyer. We also want to explore this concept of coaching the click. One of the reasons we want to have calls to action in our emails is because when a person clicks on a link and finds something positive on the other side, because you've done a good job of designing the call to action, then they subconsciously remember every time I click a link in one of these emails, something good happens on the other side. When you eventually want to pitch them an offer, they're more likely to click on that buy now link because they're always clicking on links in your emails. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but it's actually a real thing. So we want to be training the click This is one of the reasons we explore and practice different calls to action. It's also helping the algorithm. So the algorithm, the email algorithm is paying attention to all kinds of consumer behavior. One of them is, you know, are you saving those emails? Are you clicking on a link in those emails? Are you actually scanning the emails? All of those different actions score you and your sender reputation. And so anytime somebody clicks on a link, that's a a good thing for you. And it makes it more likely that your future emails will end up in the inbox. So we want to create really good calls 
to action. Now, uh, this is also maybe just something I want to make sure I mention that if you want to have a good click through rate, you need to have links to click in your emails, right? Let's talk about what are some of those calls to action. And the first inclination for all of us is, well, buy my stuff, shop here. And that is our default setting because as business owners, that's ultimately where we want to take people and what we hope they will do. But in reality, that isn't the only option that you have available. And in fact, you could argue that it's a good thing if some of your emails don't actually have their primary focus to hit the buy now button, where you have some other types of calls to action that lead to really good value on the other side, and in the process, build trust with your subscriber. So what else can you do in an email? This was an exercise we actually did in Accelerator last month. As we were learning about the weekly email challenge, it came up as an obstacle for some of the people in the group. I could tell that they were struggling to know what to even put as a call to action. And so we ended up having a really good discussion about it. And I thought, this will be fun. Let me kind of make a short list here and quickly run through them as an episode on the My Digital Farmer podcast. So let me put these in order and I'm going to kind of run through this fairly quickly. Some of them are going to have a little bit of a story and some of them are just going to be a quick list. So first of all, you could link to a video in your email. Maybe you're talking about a particular tip or a funny story or a resource that you learned about or a channel that you're following and you want to share what you learned and you could link up that video on YouTube or wherever it lives inside of your email. Now, it doesn't have to be your video. It's great if it is on your YouTube channel because you're going to get some of the SEO juice from that. But if it's someone else's video, that's not a bad thing. You can send people to other people's content. And I always like to make a screenshot, like an image of the screenshot of that video or the thumbnail of that video. And then I put like a big play button on top of it so that it looks like when you click on the image, it will actually take people to the video. And then I'll link up the image itself in the email in case they do that. Um, You can also link to a blog post or anywhere else on the internet for that matter. So maybe it's a recipe. If you're talking about a specific thing to do with a vegetable or some of your meat and you want to take people to a great recipe, then you can showcase that. Again, this could live on your blog or it could live on someone else's blog. Not a big deal if it's not yours. The third option is you could share a download or a PDF resource and ask them to download this guide. I did this a lot about four or five years ago when I was in my content creation zone and I was making a lot of PDF cheat sheets or recipe guides or veggie ebooks. And I would tell them about it. Hey, if you don't know how to use this vegetable, just download this guide. I made it for you. And they would click on the link and it would take them right to that and they could print it out. So these first three CTA ideas are really kind of in the category of teaching. So giving value, really good value first before you ask people to buy. And this is a great just general rule to follow in marketing when you're first getting to know someone before you ask them to buy, to lead with generosity, to lead with the law of reciprocity, which states that if you serve first and you give a ton of value first, it will always end up coming back to you eventually. The laws of the universe will make sure that it comes around. And I have just found this to be true again and again. When I give generously and I serve and I'm you know, coming from a place of curiosity and generosity that people will want to reciprocate to rebalance the scales. So ask the question, what would be helpful to my email subscriber or what would be entertaining to them? And if there's a way you can link off to that, then uh, go for it. Okay, the fourth idea for a call to action is to ask a question in your email and then your call to action is to ask them to reply, to answer the question. Sometimes I will want advice, like legitimately want advice from my 
my people on how to handle a situation that I'm dealing with in my life. Because sometimes my emails, especially in the off season, are just about what's going on in my world. And if I need some advice, I'll just flat out ask. We recently had one of our accelerators, um, she said that she sent a very short and brief email that was one sentence long. It was basically something like, hey, share your favorite Thanksgiving Day recipe with me, and I might include it in a so-and-so guide. And she had a ton of people write back and share Thanksgiving recipes. And that's a, a wonderful engagement signal for the email algorithm if you're actually getting people to reply to your email. So sometimes the click isn't on a link, but the click is the reply button and they're writing something back to you. You could ask for an RSVP to an event that you have planned. You could ask people to refer a friend. You could ask people to join your loyalty program. If you have such a thing, that could be a regular call to action that's in your email somewhere. You could ask people to claim a reward that maybe they have earned through that loyalty program. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those, but those are some other ideas. You can jot those down. Then there's kind of this whole category of like feedback and surveys. Sometimes I'll pull this out of my pocket. Well, I'll, I'll say, hey, why don't you go and leave me a Google review? And the link will be to the actual Google review for my business profile on Google. Or I will have a survey that I have created inside of Google, and it will link them to that survey. I usually do this at the end of my season when I want my customers to give me an end of year survey. But I've also done it if I want a quick answer to one question like, oh, we have to pick our switch our pickup site on this day because of a Jewish holiday. We're thinking of these two places, which one would you prefer? And I just send that out and I need a quick response. And that will get a click as well. You could ask people to rate you. You could simply ask an email that says, hey, reply and share a suggestion you have for improvement on XYZ. If you keep that email really short and sweet and then the, the click is basically the reply where they just share a quick piece of feedback with you, not on a Google review, but in an actual email coming back to you. Um, you could ask people to vote for option A or option B. I kind of alluded to this above in the, the previous one. Um, this is more not so much like survey getting feedback, but maybe it's just a fun a fun little thing. You want to see what which one they prefer. We did something like this when we were trying to figure out the name for our dog, our new puppy, and we asked for people to vote on, I think we had three choices, just to kind of see what people thought, and that was kind of fun. Today's podcast is sponsored by Farm Marketing School, my new online membership. If you want to spend your off-season working on building out some of your key marketing elements for your sales funnel. I have a brand new resource that I think could be incredibly helpful for you. It's called Farm Marketing School, and it's my new monthly online membership. Farm Marketing School is basically an on-demand library of marketing workshops and project plans that are gonna help you build out some of the most important marketing elements in your farm business, like auditing your sales funnel, updating your homepage of your website, building your first email nurture sequence, creating a promotion calendar, or practicing different types of offers. And new content is added every month to the school. You get to choose what project you want to study each month from the many choices that are available. Take advantage of my marketing crash course inside, I also have a new email marketing course that's only offered inside of Farm Marketing School, and there's even an assessment tool to help you identify where your sales funnel is broken and where to start, which project to begin with inside of Farm Marketing School. Plus, you can join up in quarterly Zoom meetups with other FMS farmers to network and brainstorm ideas or just ask questions. Farm Marketing School is basically the DIY version of my Accelerator Group Coaching Program. I've taken just the recordings of the teaching sessions from each project inside of Accelerator, and I've now made those available 
to everyone. These projects are designed to be completed in under 30 days so that you slowly build your marketing system piece by piece. Use the step-by-step project planner that's included with each project and the resource folder to help you jumpstart your work. To see what courses are currently inside of Farm Marketing School or to try out Farm Marketing School for a month, head to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash FMS. You can cancel your monthly membership at any time. That's mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash FMS. And now back to the show. Another option is to have a link that opts people in or opts people out of future emails from your service provider. So an example of this, I'm not talking about the unsubscribe link. That's always there. I'm talking about a sentence like this, like I have a email sequence that drips out to people automatically when they get on my list. And one of those emails tries to entice them to go down another rabbit trail of emails that would teach them how to be a canner. It's a whole email nurture sequence that's really designed just to coach and turn people into confident canners in the kitchen. And I think that email says something like, hey, if if you'd like to learn more about how to can XYZ with a water bath canner or pressure canner, I have a free training that you can follow over the next few weeks. Click here. And when they click on that, it would activate an automation rule and a trigger in my email provider, and it would cause them to start getting that training. Okay, so that's an example of opting in to some messaging, but you can also set up something where you can say, hey, if you don't wanna get any of my future promo emails about the CSA share that I'm gonna be sharing in the next few weeks, but you still wanna stay on my list, click here, and you'll opt out of all promo emails about this topic that you're maybe not interested in, right? That's another example of a CTA. Okay, this is a good one. Forward this email to someone. Oh, that's really powerful. It's a really good engagement signal to the email algorithm too. So that's a fun one to include every now and then. I forget about that one a lot. And that's a great way to get new clients into your funnel. Um, Okay, then there's kind of this category of what I would call non-clickable actions. And this was something that Rod pointed out to us in one of our accelerator discussions I thought was really good. Sometimes the call to action isn't actually a click, but it's asking them to take action on something you just talked about in your email. So maybe in your email you're sharing some advice or you're sharing a story about an inspiring story about something that happened in your life that week and you are hoping that they'll you're being the wise farmer. And you're hoping that maybe they'll take that story and do something with it and maybe take a similar action. So I was trying to think of some examples. I have a couple here. Like one is an inspiring one. So maybe you're talking about the importance of eating together as a family and the special stories that happen when you do that. You could even tell a personal story about that. I know we've had a lot of that in my family. And the call to action would be a challenge like, hey, this weekend, take some time to make a home cooked meal and get your kids around the table and spend time talking to each other like a real meal, 30 minutes at the kitchen table. And that would be the call to action in the email. That's the inspiring step that you want them to take. Because you know that if they do, it's going to be a benefit to them. It's going to do something really good for them. It's going to help them meet a need. And they're going to appreciate that you suggested it. Um, Another example for something like this might be, uh, and I know I have done this before, where when I talk about kohlrabi to my customers, they're often brand new people are like, what is kohlrabi? They don't know what to do with it. And I'll always say, hey, if you've never tried kohlrabi just just go cut it up, take off the skin, chop it up into sticks and and stick some raw peanut butter on it. It's Farmer Kurt's favorite snack. And then that will be the challenge. I want you sometime today or tomorrow when you get your box, grab that kohlrabi, chop it up and just eat it that way. And that becomes a you know, an example of a call to action that doesn't have a click, but it is 
a challenge. It is a behavior that you want them to take. Another very common example of this that you're probably doing is come to the farmer's market and shop this Friday or this Saturday. Nobody can click on anything to take that action, but you are asking them to come and do something. And this is a powerful one because it falls into that category I was explaining earlier of like people who would come to our church for the very first time and they feel like a stranger and they feel very distant from you. And then you ask them to do one small, easy thing, help us stack the chairs. And in the process, when they do that, they discover that they meet someone and they learn their name and now they don't feel quite so distant, right? And something like that happens when you ask people to do these small little steps. Uh, that's going to be a little different for everyone, but it moves them a little bit closer, makes them feel a little bit more like they're a part of the community. Okay, let's move on to the next possible call to action idea. And this is all about social media. So follow us on social media. You can ask them to share stuff on social media. You can point to a specific post that you put into the world that day and say, hey, you really need to go look at this. There are a ton of comments on it and read what people are saying and share your opinion. Okay, so if there's something that's gone a little viral. You could also ask people to join one of your Facebook group communities if you feel like, if you have a really strong one, that's definitely one of my calls to action. Okay, this is another good one. Save, you could ask people to save the email in a folder. This is another very powerful signal to the email algorithm if you can get people to do that. So I often will ask people to do this when they are just joining my email list for the first time or if they're getting a confirmation email, I might I might say, hey, save this in your folder, especially if it has things like login information and password information. I'll coach them in that first onboarding email sequence. Save this in a folder so that if you ever lose access or lose cookies or something and you can't remember how to log in to your online store platform, you can find it here and quickly access it again and see your password. Okay, of course I'm going to mention buy my offer, uh, shop now, and there's so many different iterations of that. Whatever your offer is, we could spend an entire like month just talking about offers. In fact, I have a project that I'm working on right now with one of my accelerator cohorts where we are, it's called the build a better offer challenge. And we're for an entire month, we're just playing around with the different levers that you can pull in creating offers. And it's super fun. So there's a lot of different ways to spin offers and different ways to word this. But that is definitely a very common call to action. And it probably should get at least 50% of your CTAs in your emails. Gift this. That could be a call to action. So they're not buying it for themselves, but they're buying it for someone else. So sometimes suggesting people to people how to use the product or how to sell the product. Um, so, hey, this isn't just something you could buy for you. You could gift this. And now all of a sudden they're looking at your product through a different lens. Become a member and get exclusive benefits that unlock with premium access. This is sort of similar to buy my offer or shop now, but you are perhaps if you have a membership in your product suite, this might be a consistent call to action that's always in the PS. Hey, when you're ready, you can become a member of my CSA subscription program. I know this is something that I do inside of Digital Farmer when I send a weekly email to everyone. Um, I The bulk of the email is usually about the podcast and what I taught and the, the tip of the day or the tip of the week, the marketing lesson. But I always have an invitation in my PS, hey, when you're ready or if you're interested, you can join my Farm Marketing School um, membership. Um, and I'll put the link in there. Or you can join uh, the wait list for Accelerator, right? Like those are my two primary calls to action right now that sort of shift in the different seasons. But they just live there in the PS and there's a certain percentage of people every single week that will click on them and take me up on that offer. So that is a, another idea just to have the thing you want to take people to. Where are you guiding people because you know it's going to help them and benefit them? That can just live in the PS consistently and if it's something like become a member, become a member, well, eventually you might have some people that graduate and decide that they're ready for that. And then finally, my last idea here was donate now or support a cause. 
sometimes this is kind of like shop now or buy my offer, right? But sometimes the offer isn't again a product for you, but it's I'm doing a special thing this month where we're donating some money for XYZ charity or I know we did a tip the staff uh, event last month where for a couple of weeks I was encouraging people to donate money so that we could tip our production crew generously and we had a lot of people participate in that and that was the call to action donate now support this really cool cause okay so that's kind of a good comprehensive list if you can think of something else that you do that I did bring up I would love it if you would message me either email me or you can go to my instagram at my digital farmer and let me know like tag at my digital farmer And then let me know another idea of something that you uh, would suggest. Um, I want to just end this podcast by sharing a couple of quick tips here. If you, when you, I should say, when you create your call to action, I have learned that you get a lot more clicks if you turn it into an actual button and not just a hyperlink. You can also have hyperlinks, but if you turn it into a button, you'll notice that the click-through rate goes up. And to put your calls to action in multiple places in the email, don't just have the one place at the end. If if it fits in the messaging, scatter it. Have one near the top or middle, have one near the end, and try to put one in the PS because a lot of times people will skim the email and most people will go all the way down to the PS and read the PS. So they'll at least see it there. A PS is a powerful place to have that call to action button. When I throw it in the PS, I don't usually turn it into a button though. There it's a hyperlink and it's bold, but I try to put the buttons um, in the actual email body somewhere. It seems to draw the eye and I feel like people just know when they see buttons, oh, I'm supposed to click on that. Now, I encourage you to go through this podcast again if you found this helpful and make a list. Just write down all of the different ideas I shared with you, put them into a Google Doc, print it out, and stick it somewhere near your desk, on the wall, or maybe you just leave it on your computer. And the next time you have to write an email and you can't figure out what to talk about, you can look at that cheat sheet and remind yourself, oh, I've got all of these different ways that I can ask people to respond. And that will free you up a little bit. You can focus on maybe just telling a fun story that happened that week and you don't have to sit there and be like, oh, I don't have anything to sell this week. I don't know what should my call to action be. You can look at that list and be like, oh, I could just ask them to forward it to a friend, right? And it'll unlock you a little bit. I think that would be a fantastic idea. And maybe if I get my uh, act together, I can write all these down into a cheat sheet and include it in the show notes. No promises. But eventually I will make such a resource because this is a really great idea to have a a cheat sheet of common calls to action for emails. So the show notes today can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 239. And my challenge for you today is to choose one of these calls to action that maybe you haven't used before in a while and use that this week in your weekly email. What do you think? Can you do it? I think you can. All right. If you liked today's episode, please share this with another farmer. Did you see what I just did there? Yeah. I asked you to forward this episode to someone else. No, seriously though, I would love it if you know some people that are also farmers that you think would benefit from the stuff that I teach here, please just go and copy the link of this of this particular episode and text it to someone right now and say, you have got to listen to this. Um, or go to my Instagram at my digital farmer, follow me there and then tag, go to a, a farmer friend and tag at my digital farmer, like let them know that I exist or share one of my reels, share one of my stories so they can start following me and learning too. That would be great. I'm trying to help farmers just get better at selling and be confident in themselves, be confident in their pricing, be confident in their value and know that we need you. We need more farmers in the world. We need to protect us as a natural resource. And so however I can do that to help you make more money and feel profitable, I want to help you do that. 
If you want to get onto my email list, I have some free stuff to send your way to get you better at your marketing. Remember, you can sign up for that at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. If you want to do that CSA challenge with me, the startup challenge, you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash CSA startup. You can do that any time of year, actually. So if you're listening to this in the summertime, feel free to go sign up and you'll still be able to access the the training materials. But it's a, a fun activity like that I like to do with farmers in December every year. And so if you're listening to it in December, I'll be showing up in the Facebook group, kind of supplementing the material that you're getting once you subscribe. Thanks so much for joining me today, everyone. I'll catch you next time for another episode of the My Digital Farmer Podcast. Bye-bye.